Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Here we are again on another beautiful Sabbath day. I'd like to say welcome to each and every one of you. I'd like to say welcome to each and every one of you that are viewing on the YouTube channel or listening online. We are glad that you could make it this morning to join us in Sabbath school study. Uh, this is a good it's a good book, Psalms, because it addresses almost every situation that you may find yourself in as you go through your daily walk and as you go through your spiritual walk. And as we noted earlier at the beginning of the lesson, Psalms is composed by a number of different writers, and each one of them gives you a different perspective, but all are prayers and his things. Uh, so we will look at them in, in a different light. Uh, I'm ready for I'm you. All right. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Now, uh, that was a, a mistake on my half, and I apologize for that, but that that's one of those phone calls that came 15 minutes late. <laughs> so, and I excuse myself uh, from your punishment, should I say. But we this morning, we will look into lesson number four. Lesson number four, the Lord hears and delivers. And I pray that he'll deliver me from the wrath of my technology person for that mistake. <laughs> amen, amen. Let's bow our heads. Catalan Father, we thank you for another beautiful Sabbath. We thank you for life, health, strength, food, rain, clothing, and shelter. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. But mostly we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Give us what we need as we open your word. Forgive us. Be with those that are here, those that are on their way, those that are watching online. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord hears and delivers. Our memory verse is found in Psalms 34 and 17, 34 and 17, and it reads, The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. Not some of their troubles, all their troubles. He delivers them out of all their troubles. Now, we can find ourselves in trouble a lot, but to know that God will deliver you out of all of your troubles should be reassuring. It should be comforting. It should be something that you look forward to because if you don't have deliverance when you get in trouble, then what, I mean, what's the purpose of this? If when we get in trouble, someone will not deliver us. But nevertheless, verse says that Lord will hear you and deliver you out of all your troubles. Amen. Again and again, the Psalms highlights the truth that sovereign Lord uh, who created and sustains the universe also reveals himself as a personal God, a personal God, get this, a God who initiates and sustains a relationship with his people. He initiates and he sustains a relationship with his people, which means he starts the relationship and he holds it. He holds it and he supports it. So, we can take solace and take confidence that he will initiate a relationship and he will hold a relationship, which means uh, he looks to be with us and looks to help us and support us at all times in any situation. So let's move to uh, Sunday. Sunday, my frame was not hidden from you. 
my frame was not hidden from you. Did you ever want to help somebody and had no means? Did you ever want to help somebody and didn't have a way to help them? Likewise, did you find yourself in a situation where someone wanted to help you, but they didn't know what you needed? See, when you want to do something and can't do it, you kind of feel restrained. You kind of feel handcuffed because we should all want to help somebody. That's what we should want to do. But if we can't help them by whatever reason, then we find ourselves in a predicament. Now, God has both the perfect knowledge of us and our circumstances. How about that? See, he has the means to help us. Regardless of our circumstance, regardless of what we find ourselves in, he has the means to help us. He's not restrained. He's not handcuffed by anything because he is God. So anything you need, just as the verse says, remember the verse says, he delivers them from all, all their circumstances, all their troubles. That's what he is here for. The knowledge of the, the knowledge, God's knowledge of the psalmist, that's the person that wrote it, God's knowledge of the psalmist is so great and unique that even his mother's womb could not hide him from him. How serious is that? That's serious. Not even when you're in your mother's womb, you could not be hid from God. Hey. The wonderful thing about God is that since he knows us so intimately, does that scare you? Does it scare you that he knows everything about you? The stuff that I can hide from you, I can't hide it from God. The stuff that I don't know about you, he knows. There's nothing that you can hide from him. Now, does this scare you? Now, if I knew some of your dark thoughts, some of your dark secrets, and vice versa, if you knew some of mine, that might scare because I don't want you to know my dark secrets. That should scare me because what if you tell someone? Do you look at me in a different light when you know my dark secrets? Most people do. They say they don't. They do because they're human. They're human and they're, no, they're, they're naturally cautious. They're naturally cautious because you don't want, now granted, when we say something like, uh, this person is an axe murderer, this person is a terrorist, immediately our guards go up because of what we know about them. But does God feel that way? Hmm? Does he feel that some of our dark secrets should keep him uh, from loving us as he does? Does he still love us? Oh, then why don't you love the axe murderer and the terrorist? Huh? We're not God. I love that. <laughs> That's when people say, uh, yeah, I should, but I ain't there yet. I ain't there yet, so, so I can't love you like God loves you. I, I. See, that's why some people joke about the mercy of God. I throw myself on God's mercy because I ain't throwing myself on y'all mercy because y'all may hurt me bad. It's God's mercy. That's the beautiful thing. This wonderful truth about how he knows us so instantly should not scare us, but it should drive us into the arms of Jesus. See, it should drive us into the arms of Jesus. Why? Why should it? Because he's not going to judge us. He's not going to have that barrier up. Because he knows, he already knows our dark secrets. It should drive us into his arms. It should not scare you as it should if a human. So, it should drive you into the arms of Jesus just what he's accomplished for us at the cross. Died while we were yet sinners. Before we even came on the scene. While we were in our mother's womb, loved you while you were yet sinners. 
That's a beautiful thing. Amen. There's no place in the God, no place in the universe where we can be out of God's reach or sight. Can you hide from God? Can you go somewhere where he can't see you? So, why do we think that God will not treat us the same if we sin, if we have some dark secret? Why do we think, some people have already had thoughts in their head, why well, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to ask for forgiveness. Why are we like that? Not only do we not understand how much God loves us, but we as human nature, we are hard on ourselves. Low self-esteem is a dangerous thing. Low self-esteem. I'm not worthy. When God tells you, were, were you fearfully and wonderfully made? So why aren't you worthy? He made you. God doesn't make anything worthless. So, that low self-esteem, <laughs> the realization of his greatness, and the realization of his greatness should prompt an outburst of praise. Some might find that the fact that God knows so much about them, even their darkest secrets, a rather frightening thought. Why is the gospel then our only hope? Some might find that his, his knowledge of our deepest, darkest secrets should be frightening. So why should the gospel give us hope? What's the gospel? Somebody help me. Say again. Now, why is this our only hope? Say again. Amen. Does Jesus' love give you hope? Does his mercy, grace, forgiveness, does it give you hope? Is that part of the gospel? Amen. Let's move. Monday, the assurance of God's care. The assurance of God's care. Psalms 121 celebrates the power of the creator. He will not allow your foot to be moved. The image of a foot is descriptive in one's life journey. When you go somewhere, if you're on a journey, do you not use your feet to move? He said he will not allow your feet to be moved, your foot to be moved. Now, does that mean he will not allow you to get off track? Will he allow you to stay on course? Every single one of us is on a journey. Where? I, I don't, hey. <laughs> you know, some people say, yeah, where you going, you ain't gonna like when you get there. Every one of us is on a journey. Now, that journey is something that you chose to travel. Because if I choose to travel if I choose a destination, that's by choice. If we are on a journey to something spiritual, something eternal, heaven, he will not allow your foot to be moved. But if you are on a journey somewhere else, how does that play out? Will he bring you back on course? Will he allow you to go where you're going, even though it might not be nice? He will not allow your foot to be moved. Number two, the image of God as Israel's keeper does not sleep nor slumber. How many of you have ever been up for two, three days straight without sleep? Let's not go three. Let's go one or two all days. You ever work a double shift and uh, 
don't get no sleep or some, whatever circumstances where you haven't slept in 34, 36, 38 hours. Can you feel tired? Can you imagine God never sleeping nor slumbering? You know how bad and tired you feel when you've not slept. Imagine eternity or since his existence, whoever knows, never sleeping nor slumbering. If I went three or four days without sleep, I would probably fall out. But he never sleeps or slumbers. Number three, the Lord is your shade. He provides physical and spiritual shelter to his people. Shade has always been something that has been depicted as protection from the sun, something cooling and comforting. Shade. Number four, God is at your right hand. The right hand typically designates a person's stronger hand, the hand of action. Now, for those couple of people that are left-handed, that's your hand of action. But the majority of people are right-handed. That is the hand of action. That is the hand of control, the hand of power. Some boxers can only hit with power from one side. The good ones have power from both hands. But typically, that hand of power is the right hand. Number five, his protection of his people is clearly confirmed in Psalms 121. These poetic figures underscore God's comprehensive, unceasing care. Unceasing care. He never stops caring for you. He never stops caring for you. Regardless of the situation you find yourself in. Any comments on Monday? Tuesday. The Lord is a refuge in adversity. Refuge in adversity. The psalmist encounters various sorts of troubles, as we do in time, turns to the Lord who is a refuge in every adversity. Trust is a deliberate choice. Trust is a deliberate choice. You do know what deliberate means, right? Intentional, focused, a deliberate choice. You choose to trust somebody, do you not? What is it if they force you to trust you? It's not trust. It's coercion. It's blackmail. It's extortion. Trust is a deliberate choice. You have to choose to trust somebody. Now, the lesson says, if trust does not work in adversity, then it will not work anywhere. When I'm doing good and I'm in good times, do I need to trust anybody? Not as much. Not so much. But if we got adversity, we got troubles, we got trials, now I need to find somebody to trust. Who do I turn to? What if, I mean, there are going to be times, excuse me, where I need to trust y'all. There are going to be times where I need to trust someone else. That trust be the same thing as a deliberate choice. When I trust God, I trust God for each and every situation. But there's going to be times when I need to trust one of you for something specific or intentional. Like when I uh, I have to trust Brother Davis to come over to the house and fix something on the house. When I trust this down, I'm going to cook some cabbage for me. Yeah, I may need to trust you for something else, but it's still a trust because everybody doesn't eat everybody's food. Everybody will not allow everybody to come in the house and do some work. So it's the trust that I have. Come, my brother.
Uh huh. Yeah. A wheelbarrow on a rope? trust that I can do it. Now you see me do it straight. Empty wheelbarrow. But do you trust that I can do it with somebody in it? Yes. Now you get in. No. Does he trust him? Why not? Does he not know him well enough? The lesson says that when you put trust it is from past experiences. Which means he's delivered us in the past. And it strengthens your faith for the future. See, now I, I'm, I'm kind of with my man there. I ain't, no, I'm not getting in that wheelbarrow because I'm just sorry. That's just not me. But that trust, I would have to know you. That's the reason I have her cooking and I have him repairing in my house. I know them, so therefore I trust them to a certain extent to do just what they say they're going to do. I know what they're capable of. So that trust that I have in God is from him delivering me in the past. And it'll strengthen my faith for the future. The psalmist also tells how the security that one can find in God, secret place, shelter, hiding place, shadow, refuge, fortress, Wings, shield, buckler, dwelling place. These are all images of safe haven. Safe haven. Each one of these words have been directed or attributed to God's character. Each one, each one of those words have been attached to God as a safe haven. Beautiful thing. Let's move. Wednesday, defender and deliverer. Defender and deliverer. What a poetic description of God's deliverance of his children from the bondage of Egypt. Psalms 114 depicts, depicts divine deliverance through God's sovereignty as the creator over the powers of nature. The powers of nature, the sea, the river Jordan, the mountains, and heels poetically represent the natural and human powers opposing the Israelites on their way to the promised land. God, though, is sovereign over all of them. See, when we, when we talk about God as sovereign over all of nature, he controls nature. He allowed the sea to be parted. He brought a cloud over their head to shield them from the sun. He gave them a pillar of fire at night. He, uh, what's the other one I, I was just saying? Oh, he calmed the sea. When the sea was raging, he controls these. These are depictions of how humans became obstacles to the children of Israel on their way to the promised land. Does he, does he protect us the same way now? Hmm? God protects you now. The powers of nature are somewhat, or they rep, kind of represent how people treat us now. Mm. And you know, people can be kind of hard on us now. 
but he cares for you then, he cares for you now. So, when you come across someone that is adversarial, that is at odds with you, what should you do? Should you lay down your Christianity just for a minute and give them a piece of your mind? No, we good, said it. I take my Christianity off and I'll give you a piece of mind, then I put it back on. No, it does not work like that. You ever notice if two children are playing, if two children are playing and they get in a situation where one may do something that the other one doesn't like, and all, all of a sudden you hear the line, I'm going to tell daddy on you. As soon as they say, I'm going to tell daddy on you, one of the children will break out and run. I'm going to tell daddy on you. The other child is hot in pursuit. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. Why? Because you don't want daddy to have any kind of retribution towards you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. No, I don't say no, I'm going to tell daddy. Because daddy is the one. We run past mama because we run for mama for snacks and for good feelings, but daddy is the one that dispenses the discipline. That's what he does. So when you run up on them people that give you hard times, tell daddy. Put them in the hands of the Lord. Because as he cared for the children of Israel back then, he does it now. Because in a couple of Days ago, well, Tuesday or Wednesday, it says this unceasing care never, ever stops. He cares for you at all times. The memory verse says he'll deliver you from all troubles. Not some of them. All troubles. He'll deliver you. Tell daddy. The sea, all of that. The spirit of the Psalms, 114, is captured by Jesus' coming of the sea, which we just mentioned. With God on their side, believers have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. Beautiful thing. Any comments on Wednesday? Any comments on Wednesday? Thursday, help from the sanctuary. Help from the sanctuary. Hmm. The refuge in the sanctuary surpasses the security provided in any other place in the world because God personally dwells in the sanctuary. You know how powerful that is? The security of the sanctuary. When you leave in the morning and you get in your car and you're traveling, coming to church, your destination is church. What are you coming to church for? Who are you coming to church to meet? Who are you coming to meet when you come here? Hmm. Is he here? So, with that being said, do you feel more secure and more safe here than at home? Hmm? See, life is unpredictable. The chances of something happening anywhere, anytime are unpredictable because you've heard stories, you've seen stories on the news where people are sitting in their homes and a car comes through the front room. People mind their own business and get shot. Driving down the road, drunken driver come and hit them, kill them. Life is unpredictable. But when you come through those doors, do you feel a little more safer than the unpredictability that life presents? You should. You should. Because even if you have the wrong intentions or other intentions, when you come through them door, you are confident that Christ will protect you. You should be. 
What are the chances of a plane falling out of the sky and falling on this building right now? Trillions to one? Because if we're here, we got up this morning and we pray, Lord, protect us. Watch over us as we go through this day, your Sabbath day. You better, you better have confidence that he will protect you in the sanctuary. That's why when you leave here, we even say, may the Lord watch between me and thee while we are absent one from the other. Amen. While we are absent one from the other, because once you leave the doors of the sanctuary, once you leave the doors of your house, once you leave anything, once you get out in society, you better look for some protection. Because everyone can wind up a statistic. We ask for God to continually watch over us, because the lesson says he delivers and he hears, or he hears and delivers. He restores. He initiates the relationship between him and his people and he sustains it. Means he starts it and he'll hold the relationship. That's what he does. That's God. That's not anyone else, that's God. It says here, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Ouch. He cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Is there anything that you go through that he didn't go through? Tempted as yet, but don't think that you're going to be without temptation. You, you'll never be without that. As long as the devil is alive, you're going to have something coming at you. Now, how you handle it, that's the key. You ask for his strength, his grace, his mercy, his protection. Because until the second coming, there will always be something that you'll have to deal with. Because you are a child of God. Amen? In Friday's uh, further thought, there was a couple of sentences here that when I read them, it kind of... I, I, I said that it would kind of open a door for some serious discussion and I did not want to let it go without addressing it. The Psalms strengthen our faith in God who is never failing, who is the never failing refugees for the, refuge for those who entrust their lives into his mighty hands. Get this. God will do great things for those who trust in him. Say it again. God will do great things for those who trust in him. This is the fun part here. The reason why his professed, the reason why his professed people have no greater strength is that they trust so much in their own wisdom. The reason why his professed people don't have greater strength is because they trust in their own wisdom. Who in here is not a professed child of God? Who in here is not a professed Christian? Are all of you? Hmm? Are all of you professed God's people? The reason why we, I won't say you because you might think I'm targeting you, but the reason why we don't have more strength is because we depend on our own wisdom. And everybody got here, everybody in here has a level of wisdom that they have confidence in. We all have a level of wisdom that we have confidence in, but our strength is limited because we think that we know 
Not everything, a lot of things. It's why we don't have that strength. And do not give the Lord an opportunity to reveal his power in our behalf. We don't give him an opportunity. He will help his believing children, that's us, in every emergency if they will place their entire, not peace, not portions, entire, all, if they will place their entire confidence in him and faithfully obey him. That's where we fall short. That's where we fall short. Because there are times each and every one of us makes a decision where we do it on our own. We do it on our own. I had a sour cream donut and five lemon cookies last night, Sister Alma. I should have talked to somebody about it before I ate it. But I woofed it down because it tasted good. Knowing, I mean, it didn't do no damage. I'm not diabetic, but I know. Uh, why am I eating this? Because it's there and because I like it. I made that decision. On another note, there are certain decisions that we make that are more serious. But we still do it through our own knowledge. Not saying, Lord, should I? Should I not? Should I? Should I not? Entire trust. Trust, believe it now, trust is a deliberate choice. Trust is a deliberate choice. When we don't trust, that means we choose not to. Trust him with each and every circumstance, each and every situation that we are involved in. If we do not choose to trust God, we choose not to trust God. We weren't coerced, forced, or anything. It's a choice not to trust God. That's why we don't have the power that we should have. Now, don't get mad at Brother Roll because that's, that's Sister White's Patriots and Prophets, page 493. Don't hate the messenger. We do not have that power. We should. Why? Still falls on us. Back to a deliberate choice. We can choose to have the power if we choose to give our entire life, everything that we have, and trust it into God's hands. Then we're going to get a little more power. Such is life. How is my time? Come on, my brother. Come on. Watch out now. Watch out now. Okay. Nothing. Amen. When the sanctuary is full of God's people singing praise, because it says when you think about what he's done, it should encourage an outburst of praise. That's what the lesson says, an outburst of praise. When this happens, God does move positively. For someone's behalf, he moves. When God moves somebody, somebody going to benefit. Spiritually, mentally, physically, financially, emotionally. Somebody will be blessed when God moves. And he moves when he hears the praise of his people. That's what he does. I thank you for that, my brother. Any other comments? 
Let us in the future depend more. Let us entrust our entire being. Because we got to understand if trust does not work in adversity, then it will work nowhere. Nowhere. Trust. All the psalmists write, trust in God. It all boils down to trust. That's where it comes. Trust, but trust that what he did at Calvary will cover everything. I thank you for your time. I thank you for your attention. I thank you for your participation. Let us pray. Kind of Father, we thank you for this day, for this Sabbath. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your unceasing care. We ask that you would look down upon this small gathering. Be with each and every one, each and every family that is represented here and help us to trust you. We ask for blessings on this small group, for those that are on their way, those that are watching online. Bless the service throughout. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget your Sabbath school offering.
Happy Sabbath, church. Good morning and happy Sabbath. It's so good to see all of your faces here today. It's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? It's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Will you join me today as we stand and sing our intro song? We have come into this place. We've gathered here today on this Sabbath day to say thank you, to give God our praise and our honor. Will you join me as we lift up his name? sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise unto my God while I have my being. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Let us now repeat the fourth commandment as it is, as it is taken from Exodus chapter 20 beginning in verse 8 down to verse 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall I labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy man's servant, nor thy meat servant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Mighty God and Father in heaven, we indeed thank you for your blessed Sabbath day of rest. Lord, we want to thank you for having protected us during the course of the week. And now that we are gathered here, Jesus, we are gathered here into your courts of worship. Lord, not because that we have been good, but it's all because of your goodness that you have kept us and you have made it possible for us to be here this, this morning. Lord, we pray on behalf of those viewing online, we pray that they may receive a blessing this morning. We pray for those who are on the way. We pray that you preserve them, that you guide them, and that they may get here safely. And at the end of the day, Jesus, may it be said that it was a good thing to be here when we, have, when we will, will have received your message, truly indeed, it would do us well, and it would be a blessing unto us and to others. May you keep us, and may you watch over the proceedings of today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated.
You know, there's an old songwriter that says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Good morning, Ebenezer. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning, Ebenezer. Are you happy this morning? You, you are? I hope you're happy in the name of uh, Jesus Christ. We're so happy to be in the house of the Lord uh, this morning. I was so anxious for the week to come to an end so I can come uh, and meet my Lord and Savior on the day that he has set aside for us to worship and to magnify his name. So we want to welcome each and every one of you in our sanctuary this morning. And we want to welcome those of you who are viewing online, our YouTube. May God continue to bless you. It is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. And thank God for technology. Those who are not able to come, they can still receive the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we welcome everyone in the house of the Lord, and we welcome those of you who are viewing us online. May God bless you. May his spirit fall afresh upon you as we continue to give him honor and praise this morning. I want to share some announcements with you. Again, you have all of the announcements in the bulletin. Uh, the announcement is on our television monitor, and we ask that you please govern yourselves accordingly as we read uh, the announcement. I'm going to emphasize announcement uh, number three. Announcement number three, our Wednesday evening prayer meeting. Uh, the University of the Saints class uh, will begin at 7.30 p.m., on uh, this past Wednesday, on this past Wednesday, I, I just got so excited that after I taught Bible class at Mama Union Academy in my sixth and seventh grade, uh, I told them to read chapter 38 and Revelation 14, uh, 9 through 11 for discussion. And they did. And when I came to church Wednesday night, I said, well, I might as well continue. We are really not on chapter 38. We are really on chapter 27. I don't know if y'all realize that on prayer meeting night. Y'all were just having a hallelujah time, hallelujah time. So I got home, uh, and I said, wait a minute. What in the world? We're not on the time of trouble, chapter 39. We are all the way back to tw chapter 27. But you know what? It's all right to go here and there, as the Bible says, a little here, a little there in Jesus' name. So we are on uh, chapter 27 for our University of Saints class, uh, prayer meeting time at uh, 730. So read chapter 27 also with your study guide books for this coming Wednesday evening. On next Sabbath, the first Sabbath of uh, the month of February, you know it is a Black History Month. Black History Month, we're encouraging everyone to participate by wearing your African attire. Any Sabbath throughout the month of February, please wear your African attire. Because on next Sabbath as well, our speaker will be Pastor Wesley Bruce. Pastor Wesley Bruce will come and he will be speaking deeply in the area of black history. I'm not talking about Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, I'm not talking about Harriet Truman. I'm talking about deep history, where we came from, the heritage, our ancestors. We need to know about black history, and uh, Pastor Wesley Bruce uh, will be here. He will speak for the divine hour, and he will give us a workshop in the afternoon, promptly at 4 p.m. Uh, for our Black History Sabbath, next Sabbath. So we're asking everyone, please bring someone with you for both services, 11 o'clock, and uh, our 4 p.m. Uh, afternoon workshop. We're also going to have, as they told me, we're going to have a Black History Fellowship meal at the church. Black History Fellowship meal. Now I'm wondering, what is Black History Fellowship meal? Y'all know what Black History Fellowship meal is? Collard greens, black eyed peas, okra. You know, don't bring no chicken in here. You bring the veggie chicken, you know, and, and, and uh, cornbread. Uh, I better have that next week. You, yeah, I better have that next Sabbath. I want some collard greens, black eyed peas, okra, <laughs> potato salad. All right, that's black history. All right, so, and, and yams, sweet potato yams. 
If somebody, Sister Thomas, can make me a sweet potato pie, let's bring it all together on next Sabbath for our Black History Luncheon. To God be the glory. Also, next Sabbath, every first Sabbath of the month, every first Sabbath of the month, announcement number six uh, is our prayer session. We will have prayer session from 1040 to 1055. We're going to come together 15 minutes, and we're going to agonize with the Lord in prayer in preparation for his coming, in preparation for the growth of our spiritual lives. So every first Sabbath of the month, prayer ministry will be conducting a 15-minute prayer service as we prepare to enter into our worship service uh, and until Jesus Christ comes in the clouds of glory. So please uh, prepare yourselves uh, for that time. If you're here on time for Sabbath school at 10 o'clock, then you'll be here on time for prayer service. You'll be here on time for 11 o'clock service, and then you will come on back here for our AYM service as well in the afternoon uh, and our church Bible study as well. Announcement number seven, our church board meeting is at 10 a.m. Now, we know that is Super Bowl Sunday, and we're going to be here at 10 o'clock, and we don't never be long, so we're going to be here from 10 to about 11, 11 30 for board meeting. So, you know, let's come for board meeting board members. And then on the 17th, the third Sabbath in February is our church and conference. Our church and conference, which is our business meeting, our church and conference on the 17th of February. So we ask that you please give uh, your attention to all of the announcements. May God bless you. Please read the bulletin. A lot of great things are in our bulletin, the verse of the week, uh, our birthday celebrants, our focus prayer on those who need prayer, our sick members. Please uh, pay attention to your bulletins. Uh, we appreciate it very, very much. May God bless you. And let us worship him today in spirit and in truth. God bless you. Amen, amen. Right now we want to take this time to shake the hand of our neighbor. Uh, we have a few faces that are a little bit unfamiliar to me, but if they're not unfamiliar to you, please stand up and shake the hand of the person next to you. Let's stretch across the aisles. It feels pretty warm in here today. I like that we're, we're closer together. I like that, I like that. So if you will stand up and shake the hand of your neighbor, tell them happy Sabbath. It's good to see you. God loves you, and so do I. Let's take this opportunity to welcome each other. Amen. The Jesus in you, the Jesus in me, bless the Jesus in you, so is there. So is it, so is it. 
for our hymn of worship. We will be making use of song number 27, Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart. Would you please stand with me as we do the song? again. Sing rejoice, 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 give thanks and sing. We turn in our Bibles. To the book of Psalms, the seventieth division of Psalms, seventieth division of Psalms. The psalmist says, "Make haste, O God, to deliver me; make haste to help me, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and confounded that seek after my soul. Let them be turned backward and put to confusion." that desire my hurt. Let them be turned back for a reward of their shame that say, aha, aha. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. And let such a love as love thy salvation say continually, let God be magnified. Verse five says, but I am poor and needy. Make haste unto me, O God, Thou art my help and my deliverer. O Lord, make haste, no tarrying. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his word. 
It is prayer time. And now as the song of prelude, we'll seek the Lord in heaven. Those who can let us kneel. Our Father, our God, into thy presence we humbly bow, thanking you for this opportunity of life, thanking you for closing us in our right mind and calling our name this morning and allowing us to be in your house of worship. Lord, we ask now that you will forgive us from our sin. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know we have done something or said something this week that had offended you. We ask you to give us a mindset, give us the will to want to do your will. And Father, as we come this morning, and me being man, I do not know, but you are God. In the presence, there are those that are sick, uh, those that have family issues, financial issues. They just have issues, Lord, but we know that you are the issue solver. Uh, so we're praying today. We're looking in your face and we're saying we trust in you uh, to care for us, to take care of us. Lord, we, even when it seems like there's no way out, uh, you are the way maker. So we even want to thank you even now in advance for the answering of our prayers. Father, we're praying for the speaker of the hour today that thou would dip him down in the storehouse of knowledge. Pour out a blessing upon him and that the words that may come straight from your throne and may change lives and cause us to recognize the time that we're living in. We can look all around and see things that are happening, wars and rumors of wars and men's hearts are growing cold and everything that is depicted in your word, Lord, we can see with our very own eyes. So help us to be ready. Help us to help others to be ready to share your gospel, to just tell them how good you have been to us. We don't need a long sermon. We just need to testify to that what we know. And you are a good God. Now, Lord, as we continue in through this day, at the end of uh, the Sabbath, we want to be able to say that we have walked with you. We ask it all, and we claim it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen.
name of Jesus we pray. From Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. This morning, we all will be given an opportunity to demonstrate our faith and obedience by returning unto the Lord his tithe and by giving a faithful offering. At this time, we shall wait upon the deacons as they will collect the tithes and offering this morning. Gracious and mighty Father, indeed, Lord, you have asked of us to prove you. And day after day, you have proven to us that you are good, you are faithful, you are true. There is none like you, and there will never be any like you. And for that, Jesus, we glorify your name, we magnify your name. You have granted us strength, you have provided the jobs for us. You have given us the health necessary. You have given us the capability, Lord Jesus, that's needed to do the job. And even so, Lord, this earnings, Lord Jesus, that we have earned is not of our own, but it's of you. And so, Jesus, lovingly and faithfully, in loving obedience, we return what is rightfully yours. And may, Lord, we pronounce a blessing upon what has been returned, that you will work wonders through it mightily, and that your people will rejoice in the end. Heaven and earth will rejoice before thy throne. Thank you. And may your name be hallowed, may your name be blessed. In Jesus' most precious and wonderful name we pray. Amen. We give thee but thy
be seated. You may be seated. It is an honor and privilege and a blessing to have with us today Dr. William Cox. Dr. William Cox, uh, the former president of the Allegheny West Conference. Uh, pastor Cox, uh, the former pastor of uh, the church in Little Rock, Arkansas. That is where I first met him uh, when my wife and I graduated from Oak Wood uh, College then. Uh, my wife uh, was hired by the Southwest Region Conference to be the elementary teacher. And they sent her to Little Rock, Arkansas where Pastor Cox was the senior pastor. And there is where Pastor Cox and I uh, became not only friends in, in ministry, uh, but friends uh, in general in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're so happy to have Pastor Cox with us. He's married, been married for 34 years, uh, three children and eight grandchildren. Uh, Pastor Cox is a dynamic preacher. He knows how to handle the Word of God. He knows how to handle that Word. And so we ask that you will listen attentively as he brings us from one level to the highest level in the name of Jesus Christ. Pastor Cox is presently the uh, director for the retirement uh, uh, services for the regional conferences of Seventh-day Adventist. The regional conferences consists of, I believe, eight conferences, nine conferences within uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we are one of the regional conferences uh, uh, in uh, uh, that area. So we praise God for what God has done for him in his ministry and how God is using him today in the area of retirement. So when I get ready to retire, I'm going to look for him to make sure I'm well taken care of. Well taken care of. Thank God for, for the man of the hour. So after we have our praise and worship, praise and worship service by our praise team, uh, I'm inviting you to listen attentively. Listen with your ears, uh, with your voice. Shout hallelujah, amen. Uh, as the man of God, Dr. William Cox, come and present to you and I the word of the Lord. Hear ye the man of God. Amen, amen. If you don't mind, will you stand and join me as we invite the presence of the Lord just a little bit closer uh, as we prepare to hear a word uh, from him. Will you stand as we, as we pray and, and ask him and his angels to be here with us as we worship him? Uh, dear Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your presence again today. You said where two or three are gathered. Uh, that you'll be in the midst. And so, Lord, we've come here today, uh, not just for you, uh, but we've come to hear from you. Uh, Lord, we've come to fellowship with each other, but we've come to lay down our burdens um, at your feet. Lord, we, we know that, that time is of the essence, and, and, and your, your, your soon coming is, is near. And so, Lord, we ask that you will prepare our hearts, that you will keep us, keep our lamps trimmed and ready, that you will keep us focused, that you will keep us in tune with you, Lord. Uh, that you'll allow us to be patient and to wait on you. Um, Lord, today we ask that your angels will come in here and be with us, that your, that your spirit will move in this place and that we'll be able to leave here and say it was a blessing to be in the presence of the Lord. In your name, amen. Our first song is, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Feel free to clap your hands. I'm not sure if, if you guys feel restricted. I'm not restricting you. Clap your hands and you can praise God how you need to. Amen. Oh, this is a day. This is a day that the Lord has made. That Come on, you gotta sing it with me. This is a day, this is a day that the Lord has made. Oh, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will rejoice. I will rejoice. I will rejoice.
similar to David's, um, where God has made a promise to you, and it seems as if it's, it's, it's taking a little bit longer. Uh, the story of David kind of begins when, when Israel is looking for a king, and Samuel comes to his father's Jesse's house and lets him know that his son, his youngest son, is going to be the future king of Israel. And that happened when David was a young man. Uh, when he wrote this, he was, he had, he had fought Goliath and had, had, had beat Goliath. And he would have thought that that would have been the crowning, uh, the crowning event. And he had slain his, his ten thousands and his, his hundreds of thousands. They sang songs of, of David's victories and battles. Um, but after those hurdles and after those highs, David found himself in what he believed to be a low. Uh, because things were just taking a little bit too long. And in the midst of his, his running, his escape, in, in the midst of his valley of indecision, he, he penned this where he says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and, they, and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may camp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me, in this will I be confident. He goes on to say in verse 13, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. And so he encouraged himself, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Right now in our world, we're at a point where things look as if they've become mundane. That we've gotten used to the violence. And we've gotten used to the horror. We've gotten used to the senseless selfishness. And it's all around us. It's very easy to get caught up in the everyday thing. And to get impatient. To believe that this is what the future looks like. This song was impressed for us to sing today. It was impressed on my heart by the Spirit. If you are 
feeling as if your faith is slipping, hold strong. If you're feeling as if you're not sure where the next answer will come from, hold strong. If you wait on the Lord, the, the children of Israel were running out of Egypt and they, they had reached the Red Sea and didn't know where to go. And he said, stand still. It's oftentimes that God won't give us the answer that we're looking for, but he'll give us the answer that we need to help us grow. I don't know what season you're going through, but someone in here is going through a season where they need to learn some patience. Some poise. He wants to renew your faith, so wait on him. struggle God if you said it you'll perform it might not be how I want you to but here's what I'll do I'm gonna wait on you I'm gonna wait on you I've tasted your goodness I've trusted in your promise Wait on you. I've tasted your goodness. I've trusted in your promise. I'm gonna wait on you. I'll wait. I'll wait on you. Yeah. And I know you've ordered every step. Yes, you are the author, and there's no predicting what is next. But you hold the future, and all the questions, they come second to the one I know is true. You've always been true, so I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to wait on you. Trusting in your promise, I'm gonna wait on you. I'm gonna wait on you. I'm tasting in your goodness. I'm trusting in your promise. I'm gonna wait on you. I'm gonna wait on you. I'm tasting in your goodness. I'm trusting in your promise. Goodness, I'm trusting in your promise. I'm gonna 
You know, in Isaiah chapter 40, um, the Lord had a message for Israel. It was just found out that Babylon had come in to see uh, the king, Hezekiah. And they, they wanted to see everything that he had. And he showed them everything that he had. And the Lord knew what was coming and told Isaiah to tell the Israelites what was coming, that there was going to be a time where they were going to be in captivity. But he gave them a message in Isaiah chapter 40. He gave them a message. He said, comfort, yes, comfort my people. In, in, in verse 28, it says, have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, never faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Somebody needs to hear this. Have you not known, have you not heard that your everlasting God, your Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, never faints, nor is he weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases their strength. For even the youth shall suffer and be weary, and even the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord, he shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Be carefree. If you wait on the Lord, you shall run and not be weary. You shall walk and not faint. If you wait on the Lord, this song says, When peace like a river attended my way when sorrows like sea billows roll what Wait, have faith. 
and understand that it's well. It is well. It is well with my soul. My soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. That's what these hymns should do. They should give us comfort in times where we're confused. They should give renewed energy. They should renew our faith. shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not get weary they shall walk and not faint it is a blessing for me to be with you this sabbath day Somebody say amen out there. Amen. Amen. I want to thank you, Pastor, for that warm introduction. We go back almost 40 years. He's younger than I am. But I, I remember the smile on his face and the grin on Tracy's face when he showed up in Little Rock, Arkansas. God has blessed us over the years and I'm very appreciative for the invitation to come and share with you this morning. I, I need to take care of a little business first. Is that all right? I am the executive director of the Regional Conference Retirement Plan. And you may not know, let's try this. Is this any better? No? All right. 
What about now? Well, they, they're going to fix it in a moment. Okay? They, they're going to do it. I have a lot of faith in Letitia, Letika, um, Letitia. Okay, yeah. All right. That's, I have a lot of faith that she's going to work it out. Um, I told her this morning she was an answer to prayer. When I walked in the door, I met uh, Sister Campbell, and Sister Campbell told me that her husband was over the media, and I shared with him what my need was. So all this past week, our team at um, the retirement office on Oakwood's campus were at sea. We had a major meeting and um, I had received a message from um, Shelley Palmer, who was a, was a member of my church in um, Columbus, Ohio. And her dad, uh, Isaac Palmer, turning 80 today. And her mother, turning 75. Been married for 55 years. And um, they're having a special event at the church this afternoon. If I was not here, I would be there. They asked me if I would put together a, a video and I was on the ship and not able to do anything significant. We ran into a storm and a lot of us got a little seasick, but got in on yesterday and said, Lord, I need to send this video off, but I'm not as smart as my grandkids. Didn't know how to do it. So I say, have somebody at the church. And Letitia was that person. And I just want to publicly thank her. Um, I have since become the retirement uh, director for the Regional Conference Retirement Plan. That probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you, but let me just share with you in the next 30 seconds that after you had worked for the church for 40 years, you retired and received a monthly payment of $800 a month. Now somebody ought to be saying, Lord have mercy. Because who can live off of that? But the opportunity came in January of 2000 where the nine regional conferences banded together and we started our own retirement plan. We're still a part of the church. We're under the church's heading just so that anybody that may not understand that we are still one and so now, if you have worked 30 years, somebody say amen out there, 30 years um, for the church, then your retirement along with Social Security will provide you about 105% of your salary. Okay, so you all must have great retirement programs and you don't have to worry about that kind of thing. But for years, individuals just could not retire on that money. And the Lord has blessed us so that now our workers can retire with a sense of dignity. So I've taken care of my business and I need to get to the word. Is that all right? Would you just stand with me as we show honor to the word? Turn in your Bibles to Luke, 
the sixth chapter. And I want to read in your hearing verses 12 through 16. I understand that Brother and Sister Boston may be on um, the media link. How are you guys doing out there in media land? Amen. Luke, the sixth chapter starting with verse 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose 12 whom also he named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, <clears throat> James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zealots, and Judas the brother of Jesus, of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. Loving Father, not by might, nor by human power, do that which only you can do. Take now the written word and transform it into the living, breathing, spoken word. Lord, we're going to be very careful to give your name all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to take a few moments just to talk to you about the key to power. The key to power. The Gospels are a narrative of stories concerning the life of Jesus. His ministry lasted only about three and a half years, but he changed the world. Luke Gospel was really the memories of Peter. And it is written from a Gentile perspective because Peter is the only Gentile writer in the New Testament. Peter remembers the interaction early on with Jesus. You see, there was nothing special about the 12 apostles. They actually, they actually were awed at the fact that Jesus chose them. They were not the best of the best best in terms of those that was able to communicate the gospel. They had not gone to school in reference to the gospel and the understanding of the coming Messiah. They were uncultured. They were unlearned. They, for the most part, were not even converted. And yet, Jesus picked them. Somebody ought to be happy this morning that you don't have to be the best of the best in order for Jesus to pick you. Somebody ought to be thankful that his love is so great that he is willing and able to look beyond your faults in order to see your needs. Jesus changed the whole process in terms of how individuals were 
selected. In fact, there was a process for teachers to select pupils. They would go through a village and they would look for the brightest kids and uh, they would begin to share with them bits and bits of uh, information and then time would go on and they would whittle the number of uh, kids that were now becoming uh, um, teenagers uh, in terms of uh, those who they would select uh, to follow them. By the time they reached the age of uh, 19, 20, and 21, they would have whittled it down to the best of the best to become their disciples. And uh, they would then place a mantle on their shoulder. You remember that when uh, Elijah's time had run out, uh, God said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and see this kid. He's going to be in a field plowing and you don't have to say anything. Uh, just take your mantle and uh, put on him. And that's how uh, Elisha, became a prophet called by God. Peter's memory would let you know that the disciples themselves were amazed that Jesus chose them. The Bible says uh, that uh, they didn't have any academic uh, training or academic credentials. Uh, and yet, uh, when Jesus spoke, uh, the Bible says that no man spake as uh, he spoke. The Bible says that... Uh, the disciples were there when Jesus was in a, a boat. They had forgotten that he was asleep in the boat and the angry waves and the angry clouds began to rush up upon the boat and the disciples cried out, Lord, don't you care that we're about to perish? And all Jesus did was stand up and say, peace be still. And even the waves and the wind listened to them, to him, because they wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. The disciples actually, like we would do sometimes, began to discuss among themselves. They'd never seen anything like uh, Jesus. They never experienced the power that uh, he had. When you read Luke's message, uh, Luke says uh, that they were there when uh, Jesus turned water into wine. Nobody does that. They were there when uh, the woman with scorching fever, actually Peter's uh, mother-in-law, was lifted, that fever was lifted just by Jesus speaking a word. They had seen the lame leap as a heart and the dumb sang the songs and praises of God. The centurion servant who was healed not because Jesus touched him but because the centurion had a lot of faith to believe that if he just spoke the word it would happen. They saw a dead man being raised. They saw a lad's lunch uh, being transformed into a banquet feast. Uh, they had seen so much that Jesus was able to do, and yet uh, they didn't have the power to do it. They decided, they decided that uh, they wanted in on the power. Isn't there somebody in the audience today that wants in on the power? The power to do what only God can do. And Luke lets us in on this moment where the disciples received their answer. Luke, the 11th chapter. Verse 1, and it came to pass 
that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. See, you missed it. Lord, teach us to pray. Where does he get his power from? He prays. How does he open blind eyes? He prays. How is he able to give new life and vitality to, of limbs to the lame? He prays. Where does his faith come from? He prays. Jesus, we know what your secret is. So would you teach us to pray? Oh, what an opportunity. What a moment in time. I wonder if Jesus was here right now, what kind of questions would uh, we be asking him? Maybe, um, Lord, um, is this the right person to marry? Um, uh, 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 Lord, um, is the Dolphins going to win the Super Bowl? Um, Lord, should I invest in the stock market? Lord, am I going to be healed from the sickness that I am experiencing now? Lord, should I change my job? Lord, will my children be saved? But the disciples didn't ask any of that. They said, Lord, would you just teach us to pray? Read the word. They, they never asked him about how to preach. They never asked him how to raise money. They never asked him how to promote a program. They never asked him how to multiply fishes and loaves. Their request was simply this, uh, teach us to pray. They understood that if they could get a hold of uh, praying power, if they could tune into the prayer channel, if they could hook up with the frequency of eternity, if they could learn how to pray, uh, they could make it through any and every situation uh, that occurs uh, in life. So, Lord, uh, teach us to pray. So Jesus proceeds to teach them. It's not hard. It's not a hard thing to do. When you pray, it's like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive everyone that has sinned against us and let us forgive those that have done us wrong. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That's what he taught them. Pray with adoration. Pray for the coming kingdom. Pray for his will in your earthly experience. 
Ask him for daily bread. Pray for the spirit and power of forgiveness. Pray for power to stand against evil. That's what he taught them. His secret was prayer. And if Jesus needed to pray, how much more is it necessary for us to pray? Now hear me. He gave them the ingredients of authentic prayer. He didn't teach them a prayer. He taught them what needed to be a part of authentic prayer. Okay, okay, so you're not getting it. Hmm. Now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That prayer is not even theologically sound. But we pray it. Or, Lord, once more and again, I, thy humble servant, come before you knee-bent and body-bound, thanking you that my bed was not my cooling board, neither my sheet, my winding cloth, has nothing to do with our, our eloquence. Because when you learn a prayer, that's head work. But true prayer is heart work. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm in the wrong church. Maybe I'm not connecting with you. So um, now, Pastor, I'm going to trust you. Is this a safe place? This, this is a safe place? Nobody's going to look at me cross-eyed in reference to what I'm about to say? <sighs> See, if all you know are prayers that are memorized, novel situations can trip you up. Okay, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. My brother, is it safe? It's not safe? Okay, then I need to, sister, is it safe in here? It is safe? All right, you say no. Uh, all right, all right, all right, I get you. Letitia, is it safe? It's safe, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Pastor, I'm driving, um, I'm in California, and my three kids are in the car. My daughter is sitting in the front seat with me. My older and younger son is sitting in the back seat, and they look like they're sleeping. And Letitia says, Daddy, were you a virgin when you got married? I don't know how many of you all are old enough. I mean, it's a new movie out now, um, uh, Lost in Space. And, you know, the robot, you know, said, danger, danger, Will Robinson. You know, and I'm getting this, I'm getting this issue in my head. Now, I quickly, I quickly recognize I can't say to her, how dare you ask me that question? Because I'm, I, I want there to be a door of open communication between us as long as we live. And if I respond like that, I'm going to close the door. And so I send up an SOS prayer. Anybody know anything about the SOS prayer? 
Lord, what do you do? It's like Peter walking on water one moment and he turns around and looks to, to the uh, disciples back in the boat saying, look at me. And all of a sudden he starts, he, he, he starts uh, to sink and he doesn't have time to pray a long prayer. He just says, Lord, save me. Daddy. Well, you're a virgin when you got married, and I sent that SOS prayer. Lord, help me out here, please. And the Lord gives me these words to say to her, Letitia, Letitia, if I would have ever thought that my 16-year-old daughter would ask me a question like that, I would have made different choices. <sighs> Why y'all looking at me like that? I mean, my, my dad died at 98, my mom died at 95, and I've never gotten the consent of my mind to ask my parents that question. And I thought it was a pretty good answer. And she said, ooh, daddy. And of course, I did have a go-to answer at that point. I said, well, listen, Letitia, uh, I'm not your example on that. Your mother is. <laughs> Woo! Oh, but see, some of y'all laughing because you're laughing. OK. Listen. When it gets down to brass text, tax in reference to prayer, prayer is more of a posture and not just mere word arrangement. It's not so much as what you say to God, but what we experience while we are in his presence. You've got to learn that God has options. Turn to your neighbor right now and look him dead in the eye and say, God has options. God has options. So that when we pray, Listen, when we pray, God can say yes, or God can say no, or God can say not now. Say that with me, yes, no, not now. One more time, yes, yes. No. no, not now. You see, the challenge when you are praying is when you limit God's options. We have a tendency in our prayers to limit God's options. I've been in ministry now as long as I've been, in, been married. When uh, Latanya and I both graduated in 1979, so that's 44 years ago. This coming August is, will be 45 years. I have learned through ministerial experiences that God 
has the right to exercise his options. Well, why? Well, I'm glad you ask. It's because we don't know what God knows. Everything God does is designed, listen to me, is designed for your best good. And until we learn that, we place ourselves in very difficult situations that enables discouragement and frustration to occur in our lives. <sighs> Individuals look at me and they say, oh man, you know, you're a powerful man of, of God. And they don't know that we're just human. You think about Elijah, able to call down fire from heaven one moment and in the next moment, he is asking God to take his life. Why are y'all looking at me like that? Problems, you have, you think about Job. So, oh, wait a minute, now don't mess with Job because Job said the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, that's in the first three chapters of Job. If that's as far as you have read, you've missed the point. Go farther down in Job and you hear Job saying stuff like this. Lord, I wish I had a strong man that could reach up there and snatch you off your throne, make you come down here and answer to the way you are treating me. That's Job. That's Job when Job said, you know what, Lord, what's your problem? You acting like I'm some kind of monster or something. I've done that which is right, and now you're letting me be in this situation. And Job has no idea that the problems that he is going through is not because of Satan, but because of God's answer to a question that was raised by God. Have you considered my servant Job? And the devil had given up on him. The man Job is so faithful and God said, well, wait a minute, let me tell you this. You don't know Job the way I know Job. So you think that he's serving me just for the good times, uh, then uh, take his possessions. What? And his possessions are taken away, and his children are taken away. And Job says, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. But then some Adventist friend shows up. Man, you wouldn't be going through this if you had a right relationship with the Lord. Why don't you just confess? And Job has no clue that the great controversy is playing out in his life and how he responds is going to determine his future. So you're here today and you're wondering why God has an answer to prayer. I, I had that concept for the longest time in my ministry. The Lord is going to build a fence around you and he's going to protect you. And the Lord says in his word, listen, you're going to face trials and tribulations. You're going to have to deal with doubt. Do you remember the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus? Lazarus was so close to Jesus that when they sent a message to Jesus that 
the one that you love is sick, they don't even call a brother's name. That's just how close was. I wonder what Lazarus was thinking on his deathbed. What? The Lord has healed other folk. Why can't he just heal me? Uh, he's healed some folk just by speaking the word. And why can't he do that? And he dies not knowing that after he dies, four days later, Jesus is going to show up because he is the resurrection and the life. And now individuals throughout earthly time know the name of Lazarus in terms of the miracle that God performed. But you see, you don't utilize that information in your own life and experience. So again, you said it was safe. I am pastoring a church and I get a message in a letter slipped under my door saying, we're going to move you tomorrow. No discussion, no pre-warning, and I have a faith crisis because I don't like the way I'm being treated. And after all, I've been a good pastor. I've done some good things. I've grown the church. The church is more fruitful now than it's ever been. I've built a school. We have a daycare. I, wh wh what's the deal with this? And it's the problem of being good that wants to insulate us against trouble. So I decide, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I got a job I can take, it's gonna be closer to my house. And I am under the conviction, I hate to say this, that Moses would have made it to the promised land if it hadn't been for the saints. But God knows what is necessary in our lives in order for our characters to be changed. You know, the psalmist says this, delight thyself in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. What is it? that you really want? Who is best qualified to get you to where you need to be? So my wife talks to me, oh bless the Lord. My wife talks to me and says, listen, you don't know if this is gonna be a blessing or a curse but we can always trust the Lord. And so now my journey begins. And I moved to a church going there, kicking and screaming. And I'm having back troubles. But by the grace of God, I'm doing what God has called me to do. 
I need this surgery and I'm having to wait on it. I want the um, musicians to start playing past me, not General Sapia, very softly. And I have a date to go to Canada to do a weekend revival. When I'm driving, flying back home in the little pocket Southwest Airlines, there is a magazine and I pick the magazine up, up, up and I start reading it and there's an advertisement for the Laser Spine Institute. I'm scheduled to go to Miami Valley Hospital on that following Thursday and have a surgery. They're gonna put rods in my back. My problem is I don't know anybody who's had rods put in their back that's pain free. And so I'm looking at this and I get back home on Sunday. I've got a personal relationship with my doctor and I, I call him and I share with him what the deal is. <laughs> he says, um, it's a new procedure, but it looks like it has promise. Let me take a look at it. On Tuesday, he calls me back and he says, um, I think it's a good option. It's gonna cost you less than what the surgery at Miami Valley is gonna cost. I would take it, okay. Problem is that it's like three months out before I can get in. So now I'm coming to church on Sabbath morning trying to put a positive face, the choir is singing pain is so intense, literally tears are running down my cheeks. The saints say, oh, he's in the spirit. They don't know that I'm in pain. And I'm praying a simple prayer, Lord, just let me get to the preaching moment because something happens in the preaching moment. I would stand up pain would go away. And after I finished preaching for about 20 minutes, the pain would have subsided. And then after 20 minutes, it comes back. So I started looking forward to just the preaching moment because God is going to do something. But I'm still struggling with the fact of how I was moved and how I've been treated. And so I'm in my wife's home church. And her mother starts coming to church. Her mother has a great reputation in the community. They have a restaurant called Huffy's Barbecue in Dayton, Ohio. Everybody in the family has been robbed, including her brother, who is a Dayton police officer. everybody but mom because her reputation in the community is no foolishness. They could be having a, a riot 
in the parking lot and she goes out and says, y'all going to get off my property right now. And they scatter like roaches scatter when the lights are turned on. Latanya and Gina are planning on being baptized and she calls up their pastor who at the time was Walter Pearson. And she said, if you baptize my daughters, I'm coming over there and shoot you. I said, well, what, what did you do? He said, well, I baptized them. I just had the deacons on the outside looking for her. Same lady now starting to come to church making an appeal and mom gets up and I think that she's going to turn right to go to the bathroom and she turns left and she comes to the front and joins church and the Holy Ghost says to me in that moment now what would you give up for that and I answered out aloud, anything, Lord. And she, her testimony was this. By this time, Latanya has come up to the front, and her testimony is this. She says, I am so sorry that Howard, her husband, is not alive, because if he knew what I knew, she, he would be standing right here with us. And Latanya falls out, tears running down our cheeks. Two years later, I'm sitting in executive committee meeting and I'm voted as president of the Allegheny West Conference. An individual said, man, see this move was a blessing for you. And I said, no, it wasn't this move. See, because the desires of my heart was for mom and dad to be saved. Doesn't somebody in the Bible say my ways are not your ways? My thoughts are not your thoughts. The question simply becomes, can you trust the Lord when you don't understand what he's doing? Can the promises of God's word work with you so that now, even though you don't understand, you know that God is doing what is best for you? Oh, I hear you. You're saying... Well, preacher, you don't know what my relationship with the Lord is, and you don't know how he's working it out. God knows. He knows everything there is about you. He knows what your DNA says about you. He knows what your cultivated tendencies say about you. He knows the works and the plans of the devil to get you not to accept the gift of life. So that the word says that when Jesus comes and everybody that has ever lived is now alive, both the, the righteous and the unrighteous, that every knee bows Every tongue confesses that God has been just. If I am lost, I will recognize the effort that God has put in my life 
to save me. And my conclusion will be simply this. There was nothing more that God could have done. Nothing more that God could have done. Here's the hard part. Here's the hard part. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and called according to his purpose. Really, Lord? Even when my faith has been challenged, really, Lord? Even when the devil throws up in my face those areas that I've not uh, been faithful in, really, Lord? And God says, I've told you the thoughts that I have towards you. Thoughts of blessings not curses. While every head is bowed, prayer becomes the source of power and inspiration that we are able to remain focused in difficult times. The Bible says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. That truth is not just doctrinal truth, theological truth. It is the truth about ourselves and how we can make it. No reason for anyone to ever be lost. No reason for anyone to ever be lost. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you say, well, what do I need to do? Very simple. Say, Lord, I've got this problem and I can't handle it on my own. I confess that I believe in you, that you can see me through. I ask for forgiveness of my sins. I invite you to come into my life I invite you to come into my life. And Jesus says, whoever invites me, I will come. I believe, Lord, and instantaneously you become justified. What is it that you have to do? Believe come just as you are can't you hear Peter saying we want the best of the best but he chose us he called us come just as you are Peter come with your cursing mouth come on tax collector come with your cheating behavior Thomas come with your doubting spirit to each and every one of us God opens his arms and he says come just the way you are somebody say oh wait a minute now God is not going to allow 
his spirit to dwell in an unclean temple. But you have to finish the statement. God is not going to allow us to come into an unclean temple and then leave the temple unclean. There is that growing power. The Bible says that he works in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. The greatest danger in coming to this church or any other church is that the members of the church are not willing to accept individuals who are in the growing process. And that change takes place through prayer. With the permission of the pastor of the church, I want to open the doors of the church. That man, that woman, that boy, that girl who understands today that when they pray, God hears and will answer their prayers. And the greatest prayer that can be prayed is to say, Lord, here I am. Take me. Change me. Do for me that which I cannot do for myself. The old songwriter said, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling. Please, Lord, do not pass me by. A man, a woman, boy, a girl who wants to just say, Lord, here I am today. Never be easier than it is right now. Just raise your hand right where you are. Just raise your hand. Never be easier than it is than right now. God bless you. I see these hands up front. Spirit of God is working. Don't let the moment pass. Here is the truth. It will never be easier than it is right now. I don't know what the tradition of this church is, but I'm going to ask that if you raise your hand at the end of the service, if you will just meet with the pastor and myself up front, and we just want to pray with you. I tell you this, if you're thinking in your mind, I need to get some things right before I come, that's not the Lord, that's the devil. Because he says, come just as you are. If you're thinking I'm going to wait until tomorrow or next week, the Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. And let's access the power. Lord, we thank you. We praise your holy name that you are God that loves us we go through trials and situations in our lives that we have difficulty handling the devil wants to take advantage of it to cause us to move farther away from you but you are seeking to move closer to us. May our prayer lives change. May we learn to call upon your name, not only in times of trouble, but in times of friendship development. And we will give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Thank you, Pastor, for stopping by Ebenezer today. Let's give him a hearty amen, everybody. Thank God, thank God, thank God for the power of prayer. We just want to remind you of two announcements, and that is on next Sabbath, as we mentioned before, every first Sabbath of the month begins our press session from 1040 to 1055. Uh, our prayer ministry will come together and we will pray. I'm sure the prayer ministry have different things that they will ask us to pray for. Uh, one of them I know is that God will strengthen each and every one of us uh, in his will and strengthen us spiritually. So come to Sabbath school on next Sabbath at 10 and then our prayer session at 1040 to 1055. Also, next Sabbath, again, Pastor Wesley Bruce will be here, begin our Black History Month. Uh, you do not want to miss the information that he has in store for us. Some deep, deep black history that we need to know. Our ancestors, uh, uh, things of the nature, our heritage, even black in the Bible. Black in the Bible. All right, so please uh, uh, be here on next Sabbath morning. And then that afternoon, he will go in further detail of our history of black Americans, all right? Black History of Month next Sabbath. May God bless you is my prayer in Jesus' name. We're going to have our uh, closing hymn and then our benediction. Shall we stand? Our closing hymn is 526. 526 because he lives. Come ashore, us. They 
nature and life is worth the living just because he lives let's sing that again all because he lives I can face tomorrow because he that you want us to come as we are. The Father, help us to live it and not just say it with our mouth. Keep us, guide us, strengthen us. And let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer.
Yeah. 